The weekly cybercrime and business podcast is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. Surfwatch Labs delivers cyber risk intelligence solutions that help organizations understand the potential for cyber attacks, determine the impact of their business, and proactively address threats head on. Everybody out there, today is Thursday, July 16th, 2015. I am Jeff Peters, Surfwatch Labs editor, and I'm here with Matt Leifus, Surfwatch Labs writer for our weekly cybercrime and business podcast. A little bit later, after we do our latest news and cybercrime discussion, we have an interview with Amit Serper and Alex Frazier. They had recently published some interesting blog posts looking at some of the data from the hacking team breach and speculating about how since some of those attack tools and techniques are now in the public, how it will impact the broader cybersecurity community. So we were able to connect with them. They're over in Tel Aviv, but we were able to connect and chat with them about their research. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But yeah, I guess dive right into it. And Matt, you can give us the top cyber headlines from Surfwatch Labs data. Yeah, coming in at number three this week for all top trending industry targets, We had Daybreak Game Company. The company suffered a DDoS attack after their CEO, John Smedley, issued a verbal threat against Julius Kivamaki, who is the 17-year-old member of Lizard Squad, who was recently convicted of more than 50,000 computer-related crimes. You guys might have remembered us talking about that. He got off kind of light on his sentencing, and Smedley was not real happy about that. Just a little backstory, John Smedley is also one of the executives for Sony PlayStation, who Lizard Squad has attacked repeatedly. They also phoned in a bomb threat for a flight that Smedley is supposed to be on, and it was grounded. So he's not real happy about it. But after Smedley uh, threatened Kivamaki and eventually, you know, basically said, hey, I'm coming after you, Lizard Squad, according to them anyway, they claim credit for the attack, uh, performed a DDoS attack against the company. Coming in at number two, we had the Royal Malaysian Police. The Facebook and Twitter page of this police force uh, were compromised by the hacktivist group Anon Ghost. And we see this quite a bit, Anon Ghost, that they'd like to deface a lot of pages. The group defaced the page, like I said, and posted several status updates. One of the updates appeared to go after the Malaysian Prime Minister. With their attacks, it's not always known exactly why they do it, you know, besides, you know, in protest of something or notoriety. But there's been speculation pointing to the recent capture of some ISIS supporters in Malaysia that motivated the attack. So I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about that in the future. And coming in at number one, we have the Army National Guard. This government entity recently announced that every current and former member of the National Guard from 2004 until present, may have had their personal information exposed. Uh, The cause of the compromise comes from a contracted employee of the National Guard. This employee accidentally transferred files containing a lot of personal information on these affected individuals to a non-Department of Defense accredited data center. The information included uh, names, social security numbers, birth dates, and home addresses. According to the Army Times, more than 850,000 individuals were affected by the breach. Uh, So those were the top cyber headlines of the week. Where are we going to kick off discussion this week, Jeff? Yeah, honestly, I'm a little bit behind on the uh, cybercrime news this week. I've been spending the last few days looking into uh, cybercrime at credit unions. I I found some interesting stats here that I thought I'd share with you guys. According to data from the Credit Union National Association, There are 6,331 credit unions serving more than 100 million members in the United States, and they have about $1.2 trillion in assets. And then comparing that to commercial banks, this data is from the FDIC, there are 5,570 commercial banks in the U.S. So there's actually more credit unions than commercial banks, which might not be news to some people, but it was definitely news to me when I was looking into this. And, And out of those banks... 1,600 of them are actually have less than $100 million in assets. So if you kind of put those together, you're basically looking, you know, you got about 8,000 or so small banks and credit unions compared to 3,000, you know, large commercial banks. We've just been kind of diving into the data and sort of 
trying to see what's going on there. And I, th- I thought it was interesting that when we were, were we were comparing banks to credit unions, ninety percent of the cyber facts that we collect, which is basically you know researchers, media people, tweets, stuff like that. So so when comparing those two groups, ninety percent of the cyber facts are related to banks, and only ten percent to credit unions. The media tends to focus on a lot of these big ones, but looking at our data, at, at the recent data breaches from the past week and cyber attacks, there's a lot of small stuff in there. You know, Ohio Hospital is notifying 300 patients after an insider access PHI. There's been several zoos that have confirmed that they are affected by a point of sale breach at Server Systems Associates, which is a Denver based firm that supplies things like zoos and museums with payment card processing systems. Bitcoin exchange OKCoin OK suffered a DDoS attack this week. You know, it really kind of confirms that that small businesses really um, do kind of take up the, the large majority of the cybercrime out there, even though they might not be represented as well. So that's kind of what I've been spending a lot of my time doing the last couple of days. Um, I don't know what you've been working on, Matt, if there's anything interesting that, that stood out to you this week. Yeah, so this week we we were about a week late. Normally we try to get report cards out at the beginning of the month, but this week was industry report card week. So I've been uh, updating report cards. I, I post them on our site for everyone to see. And th- there were two that, that stood out to me, two industries. The first was the government sector, and they actually received the worst grade for June. Uh, they received a D grade, which indicates a significant increase of risk. Some of the highlights from that, obviously, the office personnel management breach accounted in June. They actually took up 55% of the sector cyber facts, so you saw it all over the place. Data was by far the top trending target, and it is in most sectors. Um, normally, when you see a breach, you know that the target is data a lot of the times. The other industry that stood out to me was the consumer goods sector. They actually had the best grade among all sectors. The sector received a B minus grade, which actually indicates a significant decrease in risk. The top target for June was Woolworths, and I don't know if uh, the, everyone out there remembers. They were part, it was a mistake by an employee. They sent out like a million dollars worth of electronic vouchers to people that purchased a gift card from them. And that actually kind of corresponds with another interesting find in the consumer goods sector. Insider activity actually jumped up 16%, so that was a pretty big increase. The 16% is actually from May, so from May to June, insider activity jumped, increased 16%. Uh, you know, a good part of that could be due to the Woolworths breach. And then uh, every other sector, really, they were right in line with a normal level of risk compared to the last six months. Yeah, it's interesting, too, like we talk about every week on the podcast, how consumer goods kind of seems underperforming in terms of cybercrime. Maybe that's just because our expectations got raised so high, you know, in the in the Christmas time, you know, in terms of our data and all the breaches that were going on and the massive breaches at Home Depot and, you know, things like that from earlier. I think at some point that grade is going to tick up. So it would be interesting to see, you know, what happens in July and August and over the next couple of months based on our data. Oh, sure, yeah. As we've also said repeatedly, you know, a breach can occur for months and months before it's ever recognized or found, so... There could be all kinds of breaches happening right now. We just, just no one knows about it. Yeah, one other interesting thing that I'm sure a lot of you guys probably already know about, but following this hacking team breach, there's been a lot of zero days that have been announced. Uh, this week, there was actually an Internet Explorer um, zero day that was found. Um, that's in addition to the ones that they already found in Windows and Adobe Flash. And then, unrelated to the hacking team breach, uh, researchers from Trend Micro discovered a new Java-based zero-day vulnerability that they believe is being exploited by a sophisticated advanced persistent threat group, Operation Pondstorm. So really the last couple of weeks have been uh, kind of ridiculous in terms of the number of zero days that have, been, that have been popping up. You know, a lot of them are from the hacking team files, though. One of the things that's been making a lot of headlines is Facebook's chief security officer, Alex Stamos, uh, he tweeted out that it's time for Adobe to announce the end of life date for Flash, you know, following all these Flash zero days and stuff in the news. And there's been sort of a chorus of articles, people kind of agreeing with him that, you know, it's time for Flash to go, you know, go by the wayside. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's just kind of been interesting how this hacking team breach is sort of spread 
it's affected obviously more than just hacking team. You know, now we got a uh, you know Adobe being impacted by it. We got all these other zero days. We got other businesses being impacted. You know, it seems like every day there's a new story about uh, hacking team in the news. One other interesting thing that popped up on the legal side of the news was this cybercrime forum Darkode. Um, I don't know if you saw anything about that, Matt. Yeah, I saw a little bit about it. There was a, the Department of Justice released um, a notice um, this week uh, involving a large coordinated global law enforcement takedown of this cybercrime forum called Dark Code. And, and at 12, there were 12 players, uh, key players in the United States alone that were actually taken down the operation. Dark Code was a cybercrime forum that served as a breeding ground for cyber criminals. So you know, uh, malware was being sold, uh, botnets were being created. It, it just, a, just a real nasty place in terms for uh, uh, cyber crime. It was taken down. Brian Krebs had some interesting things to say about it. Apparently, he was really following it. He wrote that it, he could, he would actually have to write a book about the size of the Bible to really show all the details in the case and everything he knows about it. But one interesting that he uh, thing that he pointed out that while it's great that this cybercrime forum was taken down, unfortunately, you're not going to apprehend everyone that was responsible for it. And these other players are just going to go deeper underground and they're going to keep doing what they were doing. Um, so it's a problem. But uh, it was, it was, you know, it, it was a victory in a sense that this cybercrime underground forum for bad people uh, all these bad players and cyber and cyber crime uh, they were taken down a peg so that was good to hear about this takedown's interesting as well cuz it, it was a global effort that involved 20 different countries and according to the FBI release they said among those results from this operation operation shrouded horizon which was the name of the uh, investigation among those results were charges arrests and searches involving 70 dark code members and associates around the world um, and that, that resulted again in uh, U.S. indictments against 12 individuals associated with the forum, including its administrator. We can move on to our, our cyber tip of the week. A cybersecurity researcher tweeted out that he received United Airlines' top reward of 1 million miles for exposing a flaw that could have allowed hackers to seize control of one of the airline's websites. In an interview with Reuters, he said that it's really interesting that United did what they did. There aren't actually many companies in any industry outside of technology that do bug bounties. And I thought this was an interesting story because it kind of brings together a lot of the stuff we've been talking about the past couple weeks. For example, one of the stories I saw involving Hacking Team was there was a company trying to sell an exploit to them. And in the email exchange... Apparently, hacking team was offering them, I think, between $50,000 and $70,000. And the, the company responded, your offer would be a slap in the face, the company wrote, um, when it came to the price of that exploit. We we're talking about these dark markets. And this, even if they take down a market like Dark Code, you know, another one's just going to pop up. Or, you know, there's hundreds of them out there. So there's always going to be a market for these exploits. So it's a good thing that what United Airlines is doing. You know, obviously, if people can go out and make that kind of money by finding a zero-day exploit, if we can get more companies on board with doing these bug bounties and rewarding people in a positive way for for doing security research and turning these zero days over to the good guys instead of the bad guys, obviously, that's going to be a good thing for everybody. Now, coming up, we have our interview with Cyber Reason researchers Amit Serper and Alex Frazier about the hacking team breach and what some of the broader cybersecurity implications of that breach are. The, uh, the hacking team dump is a gift that keeps on giving, pretty much, uh, because we're on the clock here, so whenever we have a few spare minutes, we just dive into the, we dive in deeper to the, to the dump, and we keep tweeting about it on our uh, Twitter accounts. Yeah, and, and you guys said that this is a game-changing event for cybersecurity. But then on the flip side, over the past year, Hacking Team's been in the news quite a bit, and I think everyone's kind of had a sense of what they were doing you know, before the data was leaked. I'm just wondering what, what's in that 400 gigabytes of data that, that make you guys say it's, it's game-changing. At least to my, to my opinion, and you're welcome to jump here, Alex, it's not only the uh, the zero days and the and the exploits. 
It's more about the methodologies and, and their infrastructure. And there is a lot of stuff that people can learn. And as we wrote, uh, we saw a lot of similarities to the flame attack from uh, 2012. According to our experience, we can see that th there is some very powerful stuff in there. I mean, by saying game-changing, we mean that now every, every inexperienced person that wants to know how, this, how those things work, they can basically just go through the, through the dump and uh, you know, learn about how to build such an operation because there's all the documents there, there's all the, uh, the infrastructure layout, the, 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 you know, the, the, the technical drawings, everything. So it's not only the exploits and the zero days, it's, it's, it's also the methodologies. And, and a lot of these methodologies were, were methodologies and technologies that were only really available to uh, nation states and stuff like uh, their hardware persistence that they can overwrite the, or implant their agent into the UEFI firmware of, for example, a couple of Dell laptop models is, is not something that was generally easily available for anyone. And now with this, with this dump, it, the source code's there. Anybody can write anything that gets put in UEFI firmware. I was reading your guys' blog posts on the site, and in, in one of them you guys wrote that a hacking team used a particular ingenious strategy for gaining access to victim machines. I just wondered if you could elaborate on that for our listeners. So the, the really interesting way of... Uh, gaining access to the machines. Again, uh, there were zero days and all that stuff, but the high level is that they used, uh, basically they gave so many different options. For example, they had the option for the simple thing, like just gain access to uh, a machine. Uh, like I think we saw in emails where there was literally an email that said, oh, this guy distracted the, the customer and then we slipped in and ran something on their computer. Then it goes to web-based infection mechanisms like sending them a phishing email or sending them or getting them to access a QR code that would then redirect them to a hosted uh, malware that would actually install the agent on their phone or on whatever device that they were accessing it with to the network injector, which is a, itself is a very, very interesting uh, and, and scary, if you will, concept, because it means that, for example, they targeted and they listed YouTube as one of the websites that, that the network injector worked on, which meant that if a nation or whoever that had access to the backbone that was using their software wanted to target you and you were just visiting YouTube.com, you could, via one of these exploits, download and receive their agent completely silently to you, and then all of a sudden, you've just been infected just by visiting YouTube, even though YouTube had nothing to do with it. Uh, and then, like I said before, the, the firmware, the per hardware persistence, where both for a small list of laptops as well as uh, for even Android devices, they had uh, firmware-altering uh, code that you could in literally install on the hardware so that even if you re-image the machine, you're still going to have their agent running on your machine. On our last podcast, uh, we were talking about the cybercrime as a service model and the dark web. And it seems to me like this kind of ties in because you guys are talking about sort of that gap between, you know, the technologically advanced and the everyday hacker. So, I mean, is that some one of the consequences of this? You think that gap might shrink a little bit? And, you know, if so... I mean, do you still think there's a pretty large gap between those groups? There is a gap. I mean, you know, there's a significant gap between the, um, if you compare cybercrime and nation state attacks, for example. So there is a wide gap of technology and abilities and, you know, even like accessibility issues such as the, like, such as the accessibilities to backbones if you want to inject traffic, as Alex just, uh, as Alex just said, um, but think about this. Think about that the whole uh, RCS system is now, in including its uh, sources and the exploit sources, and, you know, everything pretty much is in the public domain now. So everyone can 
take this system and alter it or use it as an infrastructure. Think of it like a, like Metasploit, where people can write modules for Metasploit with their own exploits. So people can now use the very, very nice and, and comfortable system of, of uh, RCS. You know, it has a great UI. It's, it's, it has, you know, all of the documentation. So anyone can do whatever they want. And they can use this as a... As the, as the base system for their uh, next operations. So, and, and those systems, you know, with all of those uh, clever CNCs and anonymizers and like automatic generating payload and uh, antivirus avoidance mechanism. So all of that knowledge is now in the public domain. Yeah, one other thing I wanted to ask you about was I was kind of chuckling reading your, your, your write-up about how there were Hacking teams obviously based in, in Italy, but they were trying to, I guess, pretend that they were based in Israel and kind of putting clues in there like that. And at least over here in America, it seems like the media is just obsessed with attribution and always trying to, you know, basically tie everything to China and the Chinese boogeyman. So I'm just wondering as researchers, do you put any weight into attribution? I just, do you have any thoughts in general on that? Well, um, it's it's funny the attribution thing because you know I'm I'm Israeli and uh, whenever I attended a Black Hat conference or DEF CON conference whenever some like you know what there's the big lunch thing at those conferences and, and 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 you go there and people are starting to talk to you hey where are you from what's your name and I said oh my name is Amit I'm from Israel Israel oh so did you write Stuxnet so it's like it's attribution is something interesting to um, everyone. I mean, we as researchers, we have to be skeptic and always doubt whatever we are seeing until we're finding proof. The thing with the Israeli um, Israeli details was pretty funny because uh, when the whole thing exploded and we uh, started to download the the, the torrent file the, of the dump, we saw that we have enough data to start researching it. So it was uh, late evening last week. Alex and I came back actually from the from our homes to the office. We started going through the data and we started, you know, um, to look at logs from the from the server image, uh, which we managed to, you know, to make it work and boot. And we started going through all of the data and we saw the domain and we looked at the domain details and we saw, hey, it's registered in Israel under a, like you know the uh, the Israeli uh, equivalent of like you know a generic name like John Smith, and you know the address was the address of a bad part of town in Tel Aviv, and uh, I said no, it, it makes no sense. Why why would anyone do that? I mean why why you know they could have used domain privacy or something like that. You know it was even you know it's 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 obvious. And then when we started looking at the code, we saw that it looks just like the the flame stuff with all of the uh, the buzzwords that are referring to ads and news. And, you know, the domain name itself was mynewsfeeds.info. So as a researcher, you have to doubt anything you see. And you have to double, triple, and quadruple check everything until you um, found what you think is the correct answer or hint to what's going on. Of course, it's easy to always say, oh, it's the Chinese, it's the Russians, because a lot of, you know, in a lot of times, it is the Chinese, and it, it is the Russians, but, you know, not always, and it's not always the Israelis, and it's not that every Israeli you meet has any relation with Stuxnet, so, you know. Yeah, it, it just seems like there's a lot of news stories uh, coming out about Hacking Team every day. I open my news feed, and I see a couple more new sort of revelations so just wondering, kind of a high-level view, I mean, what what's the takeaway from this attack, if you had to, you know, sum it up to someone? That's actually a really good, uh, really good question. The, the highest-level takeaway is that for a non-security-oriented person, it's kind of scary on what, what's out there and, and, and what not only government organizations, but also individual and corporate entities have capabilities available to, but more on the, the technical like research side, the biggest thing with it is they provided a very, very detailed and very elaborate way to conduct surveillance or whatever it is that you're trying to do. They, they basically, this breach and this leak 
laid out a plan to say, look, this is how you can hide yourself. Here's all the tools. Here's all the, the stuff you need to be able to hide yourself really effectively. All these things that, well, they still existed and they were still within the reach of all these other um, cyber criminal organizations and all these other organizations, but never really all put together in one place in a manual that says this is how you do it. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, again, from the, you know, I am, you know, we are all technical people. And if we uh, were attacked or would have been attacked by the system, it would be even pretty hard for us to know if we're attacked. You know, if, the, if their system was leveraging zero days on Flash, you know, not everyone is blocking Flash. Or they had the, those scary abilities to, uh, they call it melting, melting files. And, uh, you know, to take, uh, like, a benign software installer or, you know, just a normal uh, PE file and then melt, they use the term, melt their malware or their agent to this uh, binary file, to this executable. So if you download a program, like a normal program, so you'll start a program, the, the program you download, will, you download will start, but it will also install their... Um, agent which avoids um, avoids AV detection and we even today I think Alex tweeted it I don't remember if he tweeted it or not but we saw them like we saw a screenshot that they saw how they are melting the um, the, the putty binary the SSH client they they melted it with their agent and they set up their injector platform to say okay so when this uh, IP address is downloading the the putty exe from the you know from the putty homepage Give him the, the the melted version of Putty with our malware, and again, as Alex said, there is a very um, nice and friendly and readable installation document and operations manual and everything in English and Italian, in Russian, in, in Spanish. In Spanish, you know, everybody can do that now. And even if they're not using the, even if they're not using the the whole system as a whole, they can still melt files. They, everybody has those tools now, and those tools avoid AVs until they will be updated. And once hackers will uh, start reverse engineering those mechanisms, they'll improve it. It's, 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 it's a really good question, what's the takeaway? I honestly don't know what to tell you. It's just we have to be more suspicious and more careful. And finally, I hope that someone, I mean, this is my own personal opinion, I hope that someone will kill Flash. <laughs> it's about time. And the, the last thing I'll add is that I, I think this also really, really shows in the bright spectrum of daylight that signature-based detections really just don't work. They're not enough anymore. Exactly. It, it, we, you need to be able to really stand back and look at your systems holistically and then be able to see what's going on not only on your network but on each individual machine just to see not oh, hey, did I, did I see this very specific signature? But no, it's what is, what is my behavior? What is, what, is, what is the patterns that are happening in real time on my machine? And so how, what's good and what's bad, and how can I make that decision? Yeah, we, we, see, it, um, we see it in our customers. We have customers that have like um, a lot of uh, AVs installed on their endpoints. Their, their network is supposed to be secured and no, nothing malicious is supposed to run, but then they deploy our, our system and we see that those AVs only detect the known stuff. The unknown stuff, you know, the new zero day, the new um, malware that was coded especially for them, targeting them, the normal AVs don't see that. And that's, that's uh, exactly what Alex says, that there has to be a, a, a paradigm shift here. Yeah, that's pretty much all the questions I have, unless there's anything else you guys wanted to touch on. It's, it's a, you know, I want to say it's very important for me to say that it's a very, very big data leak. It's like more than 400 gigs. Uh, Alex and I have been, you know, combing it for a few days now. And every time we think we've seen it all, there comes a new thing. I mean, we've been looking through their support tickets, and we're seeing, like, you know, a lot of uh, problems that they had. I mean, I just uh, tweeted, uh, I think it was like an hour ago, I tweeted the, the, an, an error message that the, one of their customers 
posted it's like uh, error cannot run the RCS agent there is there is like an empty malware tool and it's like and and in the support they can they're replying him okay so just tell us which empty malware tool will patch it up for you and will fix it so and and you know when their uh, hacking team already released a, a press uh, a message to the press and they said oh yeah it's you know we're going to contain this event we're going to uh, rewrite some of our tools and we're going to continue to do business and as a personal note I also tweeted it yesterday I have nothing against the hacking team they haven't done anything to me yet <laughs> and they make tools for law enforcement agencies which also has to do their job I mean law enforcement agencies are the reason that we are all safe my problem is with the fact that those tools have now gone to the wrong hands and those tools are very 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 dangerous and people said that we're exaggerating and then we said oh look they have UEFI uh, capabilities and then there was an article on that by uh, trend micro I think and then everyone said oh yeah this is serious so it's a serious thing it's a serious issue I have nothing against law enforcement agencies I worked for the government myself for a few years and it's an important job and it's an important tool that uh, the law enforcement agencies need to have the problem is that now it's in the wrong hands and we've already seen uh, like ransomware using those exploits and it will just you know the, the knowledge is out there and it's bad and we we as the security companies have to work together to contain it until the next big data breach. Thanks for listening to this week's Cybercrime and Business Podcast. As always, you can find us on iTunes, YouTube, Podbeam, SoundCloud, Stitcher, all the podcasting sites. And for more information, check out surfwatchlabs.com.